Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Turn the Page, a virtual conversation between two authors whose work has been recognized and celebrated by the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. My name is Gilbert King, and my book, Devil in the Grove, was the 2013 runner-up in nonfiction. And I'm also a proud member of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Advisory Board and frequent moderator and MC of the annual award ceremony in Dayton each year. Tonight's conversation is entitled Land, Loss, and Memory, and we are pleased to have two recent winners of the Ambassador Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award with us tonight. I'll start with Louise. Louise Erdrich is joining us from Minneapolis. She's the author of 17 novels, as well as volumes of poetry, children's books, short stories, and a memoir of early motherhood. Her newest novel, The Night Watchman, is inspired by her grandfather's resistance to a congressional effort to remove federal recognition from her family's tribe. Her novel, The Roundhouse, won the National Book Award for Fiction and was selected as the National Endowment for Arts 2021 Big Read Selection. The Plague of Doves won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And her debut novel, Love Medicine, was the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. Erdrich has received the Library of Congress Prize in American Fiction, the prestigious Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction, and she is the recipient of the 2014 Holbrook Award with the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. She lives in Minnesota with her daughters and is the owner of Birch Bark Books, a small independent bookstore. Welcome, Louise. So nice to see you again. Hi, thank you. It's great to see you too. Uh, N. Scott Mamaday joins us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was born in 1934 in Lawton, Oklahoma. A novelist, poet, playwright, teacher, painter, and storyteller, his accomplishments in literature, scholarship, and the arts have established him as an enduring American master. His newest work is collected poems called The Death of Sitting Bear. In addition to receiving the 2019 Holbrook Award with the Date Literary Peace Prize, he is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Pulitzer Prize, the National Medal of Arts, and the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Lifetime Achievement. And he received the 2021 Frost Medal for Distinguished Lifetime Achievement in Poetry. Welcome, Scott. It's so great to see you again, too. Thank you. It's good to be here. We're going to start out with some questions from myself and the good folks at the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. And at the end, we will open it up to audience questions. So please submit them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You can see a little icon there. And we'll be looking for them. And also, you can vote on those questions. The ones you like the best, vote them. They'll move them up the list. And hopefully, you'll see them uh, read today. So we'll start. In many ways, the terms land, loss, and memory can be applied across your works. For both of you, the land, tribal lands, the reservation, even mythic and historical remembered points of origin, to name a few, is so central to your storytelling as to become a living, breathing character in itself. Louise, I'll start with you. Can you talk a bit about what you hope your readers will understand about land and what our relationship to it is or should be? Miigwech, Louise Erdrick, Indigenous Kaz, Jagannash Moen, Gaye, Kinugune, Bikindigo, Ojibwe Moen, Mekanak Wojiwing, Ndunjuba. So I am um, of the Turtle Mountain people, the Chippewa. Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people. That's my mother's, that's, my, that's where my mother is from. Um, my father is German American. So between the two of them, I can't really, both of them were tied to the land. They're tied to the place of origin and they're tied to um, the land in a particular way. My, my, um, Turtle Mountain Anishinaabe family, um, my grandfather, whom I write about, was, was a truck farmer. I mean, he, he decided to do what was so difficult. My grand, great-grandparents participated in the last of the buffalo hunts uh, up, in, uh, up through the Milk River into Montana. And my great-grandfather made that difficult transition to settle down and to farm. So m although my family are hunters or gatherers, everything, my mother gathers through the park systems when she comes to visit me here. 
she gathers berries in the parks or whatever she sees. My, my Anishinaabe ancestors really did this transition extraordinarily well. My grandfather had a farm that was the, it was all the 4-H, all of the, um, the, 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 the farm agents at the time uh, took pictures of it and I found them in the National Archives. So he really learned this from his father. I, I mean, I think there is a, there is a, a whole tradition of, of um, gardening that isn't usually acknowledged in native ties to the land. You know? So I'm very grateful because that has been passed down to me, to my sisters, to my brothers, all of us. We're all farmers, gardeners, however we can do it. Wow, that's great. Scott, can you talk about what you hope readers will understand about land and what our relationship might look like in an ideal world? I think we're, <clears throat> we're at a critical time when it comes to a relationship, man's relationship to the land. Um, I'm interested in the Native American understanding of the land. And it is, that is because I, I, I'm one of those people who believe that uh, my ancestors came across the Bering Bridge uh, in, the period, in the last ice age. And so they have been on this continent for perhaps 30,000 years. And I think in that length of time, they have, they have, um, they have come to formulate a kind of understanding of the land as spirit, the spiritual, uh, I'm interested in the spiritual ingredient of the land. And I write about that when I can. Uh, I, just, uh, I just, by the way, yesterday I was writing something that uh, <clears throat> might, might touch upon these three things, land, uh, spirit, and uh, conservation. Uh, I've read or heard somewhere a few years ago that in a little settlement in, in Wyoming, uh, a buffalo, which had long since left the landscape, a single animal appeared on the edge of this settlement. And the people were, were fascinated. They came out and gathered to, what, to see this animal. And uh, they looked at it. And they'd heard stories, of course, about the mythology of the of the beast. And so they were, they, said, they spent quite a long time looking at it. And then it was, the question was asked, what, what should we do with it? What do you do with something like this? And someone said, well, let's shoot it. And so they shot it. But I, I was reflecting upon that uh, incident that I think it's probably true. Um, and I was thinking that, yes, the, the buffalo had reappeared from a distance. It had been uh, brought to the edge of extinction and very few of buffalo were seen in that part of the world after say 1900. And so um, that animal represented uh, a kind of mythic landscape. It was a landscape of memory. And those things are very important, I think, in the, in the native mind and in, in, the, in the mind of those of us who are concerned to preserve the, the, uh, the earth and, and the environment. So there's, there, there are a lot of uh, dichotomies and a lot of ironies you know, connected with, uh, with the land and the creatures upon it. And when you consider something, something like the buffalo, you get a whole condensation of, uh, of um, matter you know, in, in those images. And to me, they're very important and I like writing about them. Um, Louise, I'd like to start going back to one of your novels. Your novel, The Plague of Doves, centers on mystery of how, quote, the town of Pluto came to be and why it was inside the original reservation boundaries, even though hardly any Indians lived in Pluto, unquote. And we learn that successive stories circling backward to a murder and lynching and forward to eventual emptying of the town. In some ways, the past you describe is the past of any place on the North American content, continent. In that case, what do you imagine is the likely desirable or inevitable future that springs from such an origin? Well, to start with, I have to go 
backward and talk about how the, and I, I deeply appreciate what Scott Momady has just said about the relationship with indigenous, between indigenous people and the land, because that came into such, it, it's, it's the source of a vast conflict in outlooks between Europeans and indigenous people. There was not a concept of personal ownership of land. As Scott Mamaday said, it was a spiritual relationship and also based on humility and need and, and love, a very different relationship than, um, than a European doctrine of possession, or doctrine of discovery and then possession. So a town becomes, grows up in the middle of a reservation. How does that come to be? It comes through a century or more of dispossession through government policies. Through the Dawes Act, for instance, in, in which holdings of, of land that were in the Anishinaabe term, Ishkonigan and the leftovers, these pieces of land that still belong um, to native people were, uh, were too much in the governmental mind, too much for them to have. They, you know, we, we have, they had to have it all. So the idea came about that each native person should be given 160 acres to farm. And that would be all. So that was a way of opening up the larger parts of reservations to non-native ownership. So, you know, you hear about the Oklahoma land rush. That was an anguishing time for people who were going to be dispossessed by the Sooners. You know, this, this happened to my own reservation. It was 20 townships and became two. So in this, it's called a checkerboard reservation. There's very few reservations that resisted allotment. The Red Lake Anishinaabe reservation is, is one that succeeded in keeping the land together, held in trust by the people. And with the attitudes that Mr. Mamaday talked about, with the relationship that is spiritual and based on, um, you know, when I say need and dependence, that's a beautiful relationship. That's the relationship of a child to a mother. And I think of those beautiful words. Why should I, why should I plow my mother? Why should I cut into her breast? You know, why should I cut her hair? Why should I you know, why should I do these things to my mother? Well, that had to be for my own, my own, um, my own ancestors. However, there's a very different way that it's, it's done. I mean, we keep these old ways alive by using very old seeds, by using very old techniques, but not by using very old instruments like antlers to plow, you know, to, to, um, to work our land, it's, it's very different. But, you know, there's also um, that, that relationship. So that's how a, a town came to be, a non-native town on the reservation. And, and that's, that's the kind of town I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Scott, I'd like to go back to Earthkeeper where you remind us of another origin and death of the mid 19th century slaying of great herds of buffalo for sport and hides writing that the Kiowas grieved and went hungry and it was the human spirit that hungered most. It was a time of profound shame. And the worst thing of all was that the killers knew no shame, no, no shame. They moved on careless, having left a deep wound on the earth. We were ashamed. That's a powerful indictment of a blight on our history. But you end the passage by saying the earth does not want shame, it wants love. What would that love look like in the present moment? 
conservation, preservation, uh, an understanding of the uh, an understanding that the earth is alive and uh, it is possessed of spirit. You know, uh, Louise was talking about the uh, European invasion or the European uh, you know, invasion of, uh, of uh, this country in, in a, at a critical time. And I was thinking again of the buffalo on the edge of the Wyoming settlement. It's in a valley, the valley's vast. And if you look beyond the, that, that poor creature, you know, you see a train moving across the, in, the, in, the, in the valley. And this is the coming of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, m my late friend, Leo Marx, wrote a book called The Machine in the Garden. And that's what I see when I imagine that, uh, that animal and, and what is beyond it. It is, it is indeed the landscape of memory. It's never going to be again what it was once. So we have to, we have to live uh, vicariously uh, in, in terms of it, we have to understand that it is history. It is something that has happened in the past. And our task, I think, as human beings is to, is to reconstruct the past in a way that we can appreciate the values that informed it. And uh, when, you, when, when you think about the, the Native American, for example, and his experience on the land, 30 years is a long tenure, you know, in the landscape. And in that length of time, I think the the Native American has become a kind of multiple use conservationist, to use that term. And um, so it is possible, I think, to, to uh, regain some of our love and understanding of the, of, the, of the living earth. And that's what I'm about. In Earth Keeper, I wanted to call attention to the spirit of the land and the, the way in which the, the experience of some of my ancestors, for example, um, uh, articulate that, that uh, relationship. So have I lost sight of the question or did I answer? I don't answer? think so. I okay. got to it. Yeah, that was, uh, Louise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot back to you and, and talk about another, uh, another novel of yours. Can you talk about the challenges that you faced in researching and writing The Night Watchman? And, and was there anything you learned that surprised you either about your grandfather or about the Turtle Mountain Chippewa? I was surprised from the very beginning. So this book is, uh, came to be because I was very fortunate to have my grandfather's letters. And these letters were written in gorgeous, perfect boarding school handwriting. Uh, I read them for 30 years and I suddenly realized what he was, why he was so tired. He was working, he had gotten old enough to have, a, I, I mean, be, be very, have, have his, um, his farming was very difficult. It's harder and harder as you get older. So he was working as a night watchman at a jewel bearing plant. And he was so exhausted. You know, he would talk about falling asleep and his head hitting the top of the, the desk he sat at. And then I realized he mentioned the policy of termination, which was taking place during 1953, 1954, it was formulated. And he said there was a few mentions of it in the letters. And then I realized what he was doing because I knew he'd fought termination. And um, I should say termination was a government policy that came about because uh, it, was a, it was in the 50s, it was post-war United States. They saw that the Klamath, the Menominee, you know, all these other tribes had glorious stands of timber and they wanted it. You know, corporations were lined up at the borders of the reservation to get it. And so Congress, both, both houses of both the Senate and the House passed this bill called termination. And I know Mr. Mamadi knows about this. It was to totally wipe out and erase treaties, which are the supreme law of the land. The first, the first governmental 
treaties were made with native nations. So the idea of wiping these out meant that native people did not own or did not have these places in common anymore. These places where they had dreamed themselves into being. You know, these were places where people could say, I come, my people come from that mountain or that, or that part of the landscape. You know, these were places in, in many instances that had that kind of relationship. Um, so termination meant was, was put in place to get rid of, um, to get rid of the native relationship with the land and send people into areas of greater opportunity, economic, economic opportunity, that is cities. So to relocate native people. All right, that was a long, that was a long aside, sorry. But um, I realized that my grandfather was fighting termination all day long, writing letters, taking meetings, getting people together. He was the head of the Turtle Mountain Advisory Committee. They did not have um, the sort of government they have now where they, there's a, a, a sovereignty. It, everyone was dependent on the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They could only advise, but he took charge and he organized people to go and fight termination. And how he did that was a subject of the book and everything about it surprised me. Yes. Wow, really interesting. Um, Scott, we're gonna circle back to one of your earlier books. Um, Able Sickness and Healing in House Made of Dawn is a kind of post-traumatic stress from his war experience. But also perhaps more significantly, it arises from his separation from his people and culture, an unsurprising outcome of over two centuries of dishonor in US Indian policy. Uh, that novel was written in 1968. Would an Afghan war veteran, Abel, look any different from a World War II veteran, Abel? Would his sickness and healing be the same? I, I suppose so, I suppose so. Um, you know, I was um, living at the Pueblo of Jemez, Jemez, uh, which is not far from here. It's uh, one of the great Rio, Rio Grande Pueblos. And um, during the time I was there, in my most formative years as an as a adolescent, a, a number of veterans from, from World War II were coming home. And they were terribly disoriented. You know, they had been... They had been um, taken from their traditional world and set down in a world at war. And if you can imagine the, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, adjustment that that called for, it's a very difficult time in the life of, of those people. Many of them didn't make it through. And Abel, my, my hero in Housemaid Dawn, was such a man. He had returned to, to his traditional world and he was engaged uh, after fighting in World War II, he was engaged in fighting for his, his sanity and his existence in, in the traditional world, which was a terrible irony. Um, he uh, had a very hard time fitting himself back into that traditional world. And in fact, we don't know that he did in the novel. You know, people sometimes ask me, well, at the end of the novel, he's, he's running a race of the dead in his traditional world. Did he get back into the traditional world? And I say, I don't know. I didn't write the fall of the next page. Um, I had to leave it there. And he's, he's a man very much in conflict. And, uh, and uh, that, that, is, that is the story of, uh, of uh, so many of the American Indian people in our time. Wow. Um, these, these answers are just so spectacular. Um, let's keep those questions coming. I see some really good ones on there in the Q&A. So if, if you want to ask some more, I'll, I'm, we're looking at them as we go. Um, and they're excellent questions. So I want to get to them a little bit later. Um, Louise, I just want to talk to you about the Roundhouse for a second. Um, the sexual assault at the center of the Roundhouse is just a small bit of the epidemic of sexual violence faced by Native women. You mentioned the issue in your afterword, of course, but you also seed ideas of epidemic or pandemic elsewhere in the novel and in your work in general, including a story about Geraldine's great aunt who lost her parents and family to the 1919 influenza while she stranded on an island. Here we are in the midst of a pandemic and while we see patterns of denial that it exists, we also see a massive deployment 
of resources being deployed to combat COVID? Now, this is a bigger question, but I'm curious. What do you think it would take to see a similar large scale effort to combat the epidemic of sexual violence? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me more about disease, but this is a disease. Well, I, on one hand, believe in changing hearts and minds, but on the other hand, I also believe in, that there is evil and women are victims of this particular evil so often that I, my heart sinks every day. We've lost so many native women in so many brutal ways. It takes laws, it takes caring, it takes funding sovereignty for tribal courts so that tribal justice can be served, so that tribal courts can try those who commit acts of sexual violence. That has to happen. Very powerful. And, and just, I feel like I might have cut you off a little bit, but would you like to say something about the virus and Native communities? It's, it's sort of leading you down that way until I pulled the rug out for you and went to a second. No, that's all right, because I, <laughs> I you know, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's very painful news because indigenous people have been more susceptible as with the 1918 flu to this virus. So we have lost language keepers, traditional people, wonderful people at a rate that is nearly twice the rate of non-native people. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that the, that the inoculations going on right now have been thoroughly, um, people are being thoroughly inoculated at this point. But the, the loss, the sorrow, you know, I have people, I, I can't even express it because the people, um, in the main, to the in the main, who have been lost, are those who are really taking care of so many others, and taking care of them spiritually, so often, as well as through language and through every other in every other way. So this has been a very hard time. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the forms that your writing takes. And over your careers, you've each moved more and more into hybrid forms of prose, mixing folktale, mythology, song, and poetry into more straightforward narrative. Scott, you've made the most radical changes, moving farther from prose fiction toward memoir and philosophy. Um, can you talk a bit about what has inspired or guided or led to these developments? I've always been interested in language. Uh, and I'm a poor student of foreign languages. I, I don't know any language but English well. But um, language in the abstract appeals to me very much. I'm interested in how language began, for example. What is the origin of language? And um, uh, Lewis Thomas, the, the great uh, scientist and, and writer, said that he thought he knew how language began. He said, well, you know, we were living in caves and uh, we were having a terrible time talking to each other. Uh, we were grunting and groaning and making signs and so on. He said, but one day a neighboring tribe came across the ridge to visit us and they brought their children with them. And suddenly he said, we had a critical mass of children and they played all day long. And at the end of that day, we had language. And I think there's a lot to that because I, you know, I'm the father of daughters and, and uh, I've watched how they deal with language from, from the beginning, you know, and they, um, they have been wonderfully inventive. They're not afraid of language, as most of us are who passed a certain age, and they like to play games with it. 
And those are the two things that really enable us to possess language. So I started out, uh, um, I started out writing poetry when I was a, when, before I was an undergraduate. And uh, that, that took hold of my love and imagination. And I wrote poetry all the time I was in college and I entered contests and I had some success. And then uh, I, I won a creative fellowship to Stanford in creative writing in poetry. And so I spent four years there taking my master's and PhD in, uh, in English and American literature with an emphasis on the writing of poetry. And when I, when I graduated from Stanford, I felt I was a little uh, cramped. I, I felt I needed more elbow room. And I started writing House Me at Dawn, my, my first novel. And uh, so I've you know, had the experience of going from one, one uh, form of literature to another. And I've written now in all kinds of forms. I've written plays and travel literature and essays and uh, poetry mostly. And poetry remains my chief interest, I think. Uh, but I'm also, I'm also concerned to, to write uh, in other forms. And I should add that uh, oral Native American oral tradition has been extremely important to me. When I was a, a little, little fellow, my father used to tell me stories from Kiowa oral tradition, and I fell in love with them. And uh, I took them into my mind and uh, didn't realize at first how, you know, I took them for granted as we should. But at, at some point in my life, I realized that these things were very fragile. They had never been written down and, and they were only one generation removed from extinction. And so I got very much interested in oral tradition and I started, I started writing down the oral tradition that I had been exposed to as a, as a boy. And that became very important to me. I wrote a book called um, The Way to Rainy Mountain, which is a collection of Kiowa folk tales. And uh, I want to keep doing that. I try to infuse most of my writing with, uh, with some form of oral tradition. Wow. Um, Louise, I'm going to just really ask you the same question. You know, obviously you're interested in breaking novelistic conventions and, and pushing the limits of what the text can hold. But can you talk a little bit about what has inspired or guided and led to these, the, de the development and the evolution in your writing? I think my father was a major influence on me. You know, I, I look back at the, again, we've been a letter writing family all along and both my mother and my father wrote to me all through my life, they've written to me. And they tell stories in their letters. You know, they, they talk about our lives as a series of stories and there's characters in them and, and there's, there's people I know and people I get introduced to. And, you know, I, I first started as did Scott Mamaday writing poetry. I wrote poetry. And um, my problem with poetry was not that I didn't love it or love the words, but that I honestly could not sit still long enough. A very jumpy person. <laughs> and so I, uh, I actually would tie myself into my chair so that I wouldn't get up all the time and uh, interrupt myself. Finally, I started writing prose. And then I, there was something about being able to tell the stories that kept me there and kept me, um, kept me so tied to the outcome. I, know I was writing to kind of tell myself a story, I suppose. Um, so I stayed, you know, that's how I, that's, that's why I made the change. Jumping a little bit into the present day, as you, as you both know, um, Deb Holland was recently confirmed as Secretary of the Interior, making her the first Native American cabinet secretary. So in terms of land loss or memory, what do you hope to see come out of Deb Holland's Department of, of Interior? I will start with you, Scott. Well, I would hope that uh, we have a, a, a whole new experience of, of understanding the relationship between man and the land, and especially the Indian world. 
she may turn out to be a great, uh, a great asset to, to us and to the government, to all peoples in, in the United States. I'm delighted that she's there. Uh, I, uh, I knew uh, Stuart Udall pretty well, and I thought he had a wonderful, wonderful uh, attitude towards the land and preserving the land. And I think we're going to find the same thing in her, and uh, that's, that's very much to our advantage. And she adds to that an understanding of the, of the spiritual um, integrity of the, of the earth that uh, even Stuart Udall probably didn't have at least to the same degree. So I think we're, we're, we're fortunate and we, we can look forward with great confidence to her tenure. Hmm. Louise, do you have any thoughts about Deb Holland? I'm uh, thrilled on a level I can't even, I don't have the words for. Um, I think she also brings to this relationship that she does have with the land. She brings the science of climate change. She knows very well that we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground and we have to act on a new way. Now we have everything at our disposal to turn around our world so that we will survive. She knows very well that the earth doesn't need us. Now, this is something that it is, is, you know, that is a, an arrogant mindset that um, emanated from the European view of, of possession and ownership. She knows the earth doesn't need us at all. And if we, if we continue on our path, then we will be gone. And I, it, 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 it is beyond grief to imagine that all of the stories, the beauty, the art, the thought, the thinking, who we are as human beings really could, really could be destroyed. We could destroy ourselves. And I think she understands the magnitude and the gravity of what we face. And I, I was thrilled to know that she has taken this up with a very serious intent to keep those destructive fields in the ground on our federal lands. That's the first step. Wow. Well, thanks, Louise. That was really insightful. Um, Scott, in your statement on peace and literature for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, you say, quote, Peace is the objective of human evolution, and literature is the measure of that evolution. So often we read works that suggest we are devolving, that the past was far superior to the present, and that we have fallen into an abyss of destruction. Your statement would suggest we are moving forward toward a greater good, and literature is part of that movement. Do you see a hope for peace? Yes, um, I do, and I and uh, I stand by those words. I, I do believe that... Uh, Literature is a, a function of the imagination that uh, is closely, closely relied, closely related to, uh, to uh, of peace and uh, tranquility and harmony in the world. Um, we have we have uh, we have a strange history. We human beings. It runs from all kinds of uh, different things to to the current uh, situation, which is which is bright on the one side and uh, dark on the other. So, you know, there's, a, there's always been this kind of dichotomy, this, this kind of tension between war and peace in our, in our experience. And uh, literature, I think, helps us, uh, helps us move in the direction of peace. You take a book like um, Moby Dick, for example. It's a very strange book, and it you know, has a lot of dark elements to it. But in the end, it's, uh, to me, it seems a, it seems a, 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 an assertion of peace, uh, harmony anyway, a, a better world. So, so yes, I think uh, literature is a kind of bridge between, between the past and the present and uh, the, the, the darkness of the past and the pop promise of the, of the present and the future. Hmm. Louise, I'm gonna go back to your statement um, on peace and literature for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. You ended with, 
quote, peace depends upon our collective will to resist our own destructive destruction. And the word collective reflects that vision that relations and relatives include our connection to family and clans, but also to the larger sense of all humans, all creatures and the natural word, world. Do you have hope that we can move toward this collective awareness and avoid our own destruction? I couldn't really go on if I didn't have that hope. I have children, I have grandchildren, you know. Um, so yes, I do. And, and I think that art in every way leads us toward conciliation with our humanity. That's, that's what it is. It's revealing ourselves to one another. When we do that, we have to admit our recklessness and our folly and all the parts of ourselves that are destructive. And I think that going forward, I think, I think literature has a very important part to play. I think we need to tell a story together, a story that that brings us all into harmony and helps us to endure because we, we, don't have, we don't have the same stories. And I think that's one thing that is very painful right now in our political process. We don't have the same story. Um, and I, I love some people very much who are on the other side of the story that I'd like to tell. How do we do this? Well, I think that we have right now, I think we've given over our stories on a very large scale to corporations who only, whose only reason for existing is to make money. I think we need to look at where, where we've come. You know, I think we're in the end stages of capitalism at a time when we really need to pull back. We're on a very dangerous precipice because the stories that are being told in order to make money are the stories that appeal to the darkest side of our natures, to the hate, to the xenophobia, and to the reckless arrogance that we have inside of us as human beings. I think we need to pull back and we need to do it very quickly. Um, there's, no, there's no one way to do this either, I know that. I think that everyone who contributes to a larger story, to a collective story of conciliation with our, our future is uh, we're, we're, I feel like we're trickles flowing into a very great river. But I think there needs to be something very practical in this world. And I think, I think we need to really ask the people who represent us to go back to something called the fairness doctrine, which was disestablished during the Reagan era. We need a fairness doctrine in our common story, our news, our daily news, that's our common story. And it needs to stop being a story of lies. We need some sort of oversight. We had it before, we should have it again, in which truth is held up to us so that we know that we have a truth, a common truth, and we can move forward together. That's what I think. Um, well, thank you for that. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? I just didn't know if you were um, wanting to make a point there. Well, I, I, I think uh, Louise said what I was trying to say, um, and God give us the strength to get past the daily news. That's a, um, and that's where literature might be extremely useful to us. I like to think about, uh, you know, books that I've read and uh, stories that I've been told. And in these things are the, the truths that will 
that will bring us to salvation if, if indeed we are brought to salvation. So I think, uh, I think that's what I'd like to add to that. Okay, um, I have a, I'm gonna to go to a question from Deborah Kelly, who says, I am drawn as someone who knows she's made of the lands I've lived with and of the myths that renew this deepest connection. What gratitude might magical realism owe to indigenous traditions? More, do our honored authors today consider their work to be in that tradition? And anyone can jump in on that one. I'm waiting for you, Scott. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, well, a lot of things pass through my mind very briefly with, uh, with, with that question. I think it's, uh, I think uh, uh, we do need to concentrate on, on invention, on the imagination. Uh, I'm very much interested in the imagination and I, 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 I wonder how many of us have a definition of imagination. I think it's extremely hard to define the term what is it? Uh, in my way of thinking, imagination is that which enables us to, to um, um, surpass reality. You know, we have the mountain here, which is reality, but the, we imagine the valley on the other side. And that's what literature is all about in, in, in one way or another. Um, I, th I think I've forgotten the various aspects of the question. Could you repeat it, please? Yeah, sure. Find it here. Um, uh, let's see what I was talking about here. Um, oh, we were talking about the, the peace depending on the collective will to resist our own destruction. Um, I think we basically, I'm trying to think where I left off here. Uh, th that question was from Deborah Kelly, and she was talking about um, magical realism and the impact on, on your work. And I was wondering if, if, if that was something you considered yourself as part of that group, magical realism. I have a small investment in magical realism. I admire it. And I like uh, people like uh, Borges, who, who said uh, myth is at the beginning of literature and also at its end. And in that equation, I think is, uh, is some uh, satisfaction, some, some reason to, to take uh, heart and to be, uh, to be hopeful about the, the future of, of the human race. So yes, I, I have uh, some interest in magical realism. And uh, I think there's quite a bit of it in uh, Native American oral tradition too. Uh, if you think about some of the stories that come from, from uh, the Diné, for example, uh, there's a lot of magic involved and a lot of, uh, a lot of things that uh, can really, can really uh, turn the mind. I like that in literature and think it's indispensable. Louise, did you have anything to add to that? I think in the question there was a um, there, there there was something that said uh, is magical realism dependent on native na native uh, literature? Yeah, that quest question just disappeared from? from my screen. So okay. yeah, your reference to it is fine. Let's find another question. Let's find another question. <laughs> okay, we did deal with magical realism. Um, it was a poetic so this, question, I have to say. Yeah. Um, there is a question from Brian Twinter who says, I thank you both for giving us your valuable time. And I wonder what you believe is the greatest threat to indigenous food and water sovereignty. I don't know, except that we, we have a, we have a, a severe shortage of, of both things in the native world. And one of the, one of the real problems we're going to have to solve is how to, how to feed and, uh, and, and give water to uh, remote, uh, remote settlements like uh, as we, as, such as we have on the Navajo Reservation. It's very difficult to get to some of these places and they're running out of water. So the, uh, the, the task of furnishing those people with water is very great. We have to find a way to do that. Yes, and I, I, I would add that in that situation, uh, most Navajo water is going down to Phoenix. And uh, that's, that's a crime. You know, <laughs> the people on the, <laughs> on the Navajo reservation should have that water. Now something else has to happen. 
It cannot continue to grow and to feed off of water that, that sustains the people. Okay. Um, um, but you, uh, okay. you were, the, the rest of the question was? Um, yes, let me just pull that one up again. This is from um, Brian. Uh, he, he was talking about the, the, what the greatest threat to indigenous food and water sovereignty might be today, so. Climate. Well, I think it is that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Scott? I was just going to say climate. This is, yes. would be my short answer to that, to that question. <laughs> it would be mine too. Right now in Minnesota, um, we are fighting uh, a really huge pipeline that rivals Keystone XL. It's called Line 3. And it is being ripped it's tearing through um, 200 sources of water. And those sources of water are pristine. And they are sources of wild rice, which is a deeply traditional food for the Anishinaabe. So it's, I think the real answer to that is the climate. And the climate is the problem because of greed. And that's, that's um, fossil fuel greed, yeah. Interesting. Um, I have a question here from um, Bill Handley, who says, who asks, what are your views on non-Indigenous fiction writers writing Indigenous characters today? And he says, I'm thinking of Sebastian Barry's recent novels. So um, anyone can take that one. I don't know the answer to that. Um... I think uh, you know we've for for a long time we've all been asked uh, is it is is it possible for a non-Indian to write about India matters, and I say yes I think it is it's a uh, it's possible uh, to uh, no matter who you are to exercise the imagination upon uh, a, a subject of your choice, so I think uh, people have written about the Indian who are not Indians quite well. Um, I think of someone like uh, Oliver Lafarge, for example, Laughing Boy. I think that's, uh, uh, though superficial in certain ways, it's, it's also a keen insight into the Navajo world of his time. So that's possible. And I don't discourage anyone from writing about what he finds most interesting. That's an excellent answer. Um, and this is actually a perfect follow-up for you. And I'll, I'll just point this one towards Louise. Um, can you talk a little bit about new Native American writers we should be reading and what new directions they are taking? Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee who says, I'm thinking of Stephen Graham Jones or oh, somebody I am else. Too. Well, no, okay. I would pleasure <laughs> answer this because um, I, um, I am so very fortunate to have a bookstore or it has me, I don't know which, but I am able to um, see Native writing. We focus on, we're a general bookstore focused on Native work. Um, so I'm just going to put this up in front of people, which you, you've already seen it. <laughs> yes. There you go. It's, a, it's wonderful. And um, I would say, okay, you're thinking of Stephen Graham Jones, Angeline Boley, who just published The Firekeeper's Daughter. It's, you know, I give it raves. It's a young adult novel. Um, Therese Melhod, who uh, published some, a, a, a wonderful, uh, fierce memoir called Heartberries. Uh, Natalie Diaz, post-colonial love poem. Laylee Long Soldier, Whereas. Uh, my sister, hi, Little Big Bully. Um, Eric Gansworth, Apple to the Skin. You know, there are just amazing authors, Tommy Pico, um, Billy Ray Belcourt. Um, uh, hmm. I can come back to you. I, I can probably just look around my shoulder and see a lot more. <laughs> and I, I, it's just, I think there's enough, just this huge outpouring, this, this huge, um, this rising of, oh, I forgot Tommy Orange. I mean, I, you know, there, there's new authors who have just published fantastic work. And uh, it's thrilling to have these books come in. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm 
you know, you can see lists of them. I guess I, it, it's better to look on the website because I can't think of them all right <laughs> off. But Stephen Graham Jones is certainly one of those. Excellent. Um, Scott, do you have anybody to add and must read? No, I can't. I can't. I couldn't begin to uh, to uh, give you a list to, to match that. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, slightly uh, uh, I'm at a slight disadvantage because my eyesight is failing, and so I don't read as much as I once did, and I have a hard time keeping keeping up with contemporary writers. But uh, uh, some of the writers that uh, Louise mentioned, I know and and would agree completely with her thesis that. Uh, Wonderfully exciting things are happening now, and uh, we have we have a lot to look forward to. Great. Um, I have another question here from um, let's see, Terry Tempest Williams asks, "How do you think about sacred land protection in contrast to Western practices of conservation, and how might Native and non-Native people support and deepen both?" Louise, I'm waiting for your answer to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Um, thank you. How can we, how to support both? Now, I think that we need those, again, I'm going to go back to those stories. And um, Terry, you tell stories that bring people together. I think we, I think we know that, um, uh, for instance, bears ears brought people together, the, the the endangerment of it and the hope now that it will be preserved. I think that we have to continue telling each other these stories and continue organizing at a very local level to save and preserve what we have. Everything does start at a small level. I, 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 I found that out in writing this book when I read about my grandfather organizing people in, in his own milieu. I mean, he, he organized people on off, in off-reservation towns with people who are on-reservation towns. It happens here in Minneapolis with people who make common cause with others. And up in up in uh, up around Lake Superior, making common cause with people who love who love that lake. And I think there's an enormous amount of of untapped energy when it comes to saving and preserving. I I think this idea that President Biden has of preserving thirty percent of our um, our land by 2030. I think it's what we have to shoot for right now. The interesting thing about it, uh, I've just read, is that this cannot happen without indigenous people signing on. And this is sort of a bittersweet truth that now that the leftovers are the leftover land, which is our precious homelands, so much of it has not been developed it has to stop and stay out of development. It has to stop because we need, we need our, our world to stay partly untouched if we're going to, if we're going to um, be able to live on this earth. We have to keep our hands off it. We have to keep our hands off a lot of the world if we're going to be able to let it sustain us. Great. Um, question for Scott. I love to hear you tell stories as much as I love reading them. You've been publishing your stories and poems for more than 50 years. And I wonder if the thoughts and visions that inspire you today are the same forces that inspired you when you first sat down to write. I suppose the answer to that is yes. Uh, I think I'm motivated by the same things. Um, certainly certainly my, my writing has changed over the course of years. But always uh, at the center of my writing is the same appreciation of literature and, and the same um, uh, objective. Uh, I want to I want to write and uh, inspire younger people, and uh, I want to I want to call attention to the to um, 
to the to the to the magical elements of the earth. We have we have this planet, and uh, it is uh, it is ours. It was given to us. I don't know whether we deserve it or not, but it is ours, and it is our it is our uh, uh, duty to to manage it in the best way that we can. Uh, Louise mentioned the word greed a couple of times, and I think that's a very important word in in the description of our attitude toward the world, to the land on which we live. We talk of going to Mars and and so on, but I think we're not done with the Earth. The Earth is uh, something that is uh, uh, immortal in our in our in our context, and uh, we need to understand that. We need to revere it, and we need to do what we can to to uh, keep ourselves alive on the face of the earth, which is a spiritual matter, I think. I agree um, and, with and Louis, Is there anything you want to add? Go ahead, Louise. Well, I, I think this is just such a profound thing to say that uh, we, have, we have this tremendous wealth that has concentrated itself among a very few people at this point. And mm. a couple of them, and nobody has to even mention names, we know who they are, are spending it on this idea that we should go to another planet. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it because our earth needs investment in clean energy in order to survive. And I know I sound so practical there because but it's a, it's a way of preserving our magic. We have to have a way of preserving it. And to imagine that we're all going to pick ourselves up. And, you know, I know we're, I know we're not getting off <laughs> of earth. You know, I can't, it, it just, it blows my mind, really, that this is where this enormous wealth is going into these kinds of ideas. We need, we need that kind of investment in our, our world right now in order to save so many, so many different species from extinction. I mean, if all that money was put into, uh, into saving and, and loving and, and capturing, um, capturing the, the beauty of earth and not letting it go. If that love was put into our world, it would make a huge difference. Yeah, Luis, I just want to follow up on something you just said there. You come from both um, the Ojibwe and the Western traditions. What insight has that duality given you into the heart of people? Uh, and how does that duality play out in your work? Well, I think it goes back to something that both um, Scott Mamaday and, and in fact, Terry Tempest Williams touched on, which is that we have to, you know, I saw my parents, uh, they were always working together. They really worked together all their lives and they kept us fed. They, you know, they had an organic garden when before there was organic labels on things. They used old um, methods to bring about, you know, to, 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 to feed us. My father hunted, my mother, we all picked berries, you know. Well, I, I saw them working together, so I know it happens. And they had this same reverence for the land. I think there's a, I don't know if it's very Germanic, but there are very many people who really have, you know, I, I know, I know it's part of, as well, of your, it, it's part of European culture for for many people to have this exquisite respect for land and to love it and to honor it. So I know it's possible for us all to work together. Um, Scott, I just have a question here for you. What role does humor play in your work? I've seen you tell some stories that are both poignant but also really funny. And um, I'm just wondering, do you feel that humor is connected with peace and what you tried it when you set out to write? Um, is, is humor something that, something you plan or does it just come as you're writing? I think it's something that just comes, uh, bubbles up in me. Uh, <laughs> my, my father had a great sense of humor. In fact, most uh, 
most native peoples that I know have a have a highly developed sense of humor, and so I like uh, I like humor. I like to hear it and read it, and I like to write it uh, and tell stories that are humorous in some way or another. So yeah, I think humor is a very uh, very valuable thing in in uh, literature and in our lives. More of it, please. More, please. yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I have some um, capitalism questions. I think these might be aimed at you, Louise. <laughs> Um, complimenting your bookshop is incredible. Um, uh, Alexandria Alugana, I hope I pronounced her name. She says, I agree that this is the end of capitalism. What ways can we rebuild our path, pathways toward liberation that include our youth and elders? Well, I, I know this is going to sound kind of hopelessly boring, but we, we have to get everyone everyone who is disenfranchised in this country, we have to let them vote, we have to let our people vote. We have to get people who really have suffered the effects of capitalism to have a voice in this country. You know, the fact that um, corporations are considered people is beyond the scope of my imagination. I cannot really grasp that. But that is what has come to have. That's what's what's come to be, and uh, that that corporations are the free speech of corporations is protected, and that means that they can say anything to make money. You know, that's a huge problem. So I think it starts in a mundane sense with organizing at a granular level local people and, 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 ta and taking the power to make decisions back to people. We can't, let, we can't let our voting rights be destroyed and mutilated. We have to keep them. We have to keep working at this. And I, I know it sounds less grand than I'd like to, but, but I think that's where it starts. I work with the Movement Voter Project. It just works. That's why Arizona had such a surge and why Georgia, you know, this is, this is very small, but it's huge. And that's how, that's how we fight our way back to some human and humane sense of what our country can be. Yeah. Scott, anything to add to that? I don't think so. I think uh, she said it uh, as well as I could, certainly. Wow, that was brilliant. Um, so I actually think we'll, we'll end here. I think we had some great questions from the audience today, which had a really nice crowd in there as well. Um, but I just want to thank you and, and, and Louise and Scott for coming and, and being so generous with your time on behalf of the Turn the Page and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Um, stay tuned for announcement on the next Turn the Page. Um, very close to announcing that. We wish, hope to do it today, but we don't have it ready. But I want to thank and Scott Mamaday and Louise Ervich for their generous appearance tonight. Uh, it's been a privilege and honor to host this and great seeing so many of you. Um, we will see you next time, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, too.